there once was a man, a man born in a forgotten time, created by a force of unknown origin. He would cross the ages knowing his one purpose, to lead humanity as the greatest empire in the galaxy, the Imperium of Man. In this time, he would be known by only one name, the Emperor of Mankind. This is Lutin. I must first apologise for the length of time since the last project. The simplest explanation is, it took me a long time to compile amid many other things going on for me. So we now move on from the Eldar history and wade into one of the most important and complicated narratives in the universe of the 41st millennium. It is of course, the rise of humanity and the Imperium. In the dark, never ceasing war that is the future, humans have risen to control and maintain a galaxy-spanning empire whose official title is the Imperium of Mankind. The Imperium is the largest and most powerful political entity in the galaxy. It has been established for a period of some 10,000 years up to its present date in the age of Warhammer 40k. The lore and scripture around this period is massive. Despite this daunting task though, I have decided to interpret it in one piece chronologically, splitting it into chapters so as to best enable you guys to get an understanding and a grasp of what it is all about. This is the third video in my Warhammer 40,000 lore series and it seeks to create a foundation for all of the further videos which talk about the Imperium of Man. The Imperium of Man consists of the planets, systems and forces throughout the galaxy which contain Imperial citizens and their derivatives. Not all humans are universally members of the Imperium though, and as you would expect there are rogue traders and those who choose to live on the legal fringes of society. The single most important figure within the Imperium is the aforementioned founder, saviour and ruler of this empire known as the Emperor of Mankind. He formed the Imperium some 10,000 years previous to the current established date in the universe of Warhammer 40,000 at the end of the 30th millennium. This occurred following an especially brutal period of societal disintegration during the last days of the Age of Strife. In this video, I'll outline the political state that is the Imperium as well as the history behind how humanity reached this point in the far future. As with anything though, the complexity and depth of the law means I can't cover it in its fleshed entirety, so some tangents are going to have to remain for future videos, but I do my best to cover as much as possible which is relevant. The Emperor of Man sits as an extremely powerful figure within the Imperium. Make no mistake, he is the centre of humanity in the 41st millennium. So powerful a humanoid, he was arguably barely human to begin with, and he continues to protect mankind after his mortal wounding during the final battles of a period known as the Horus Heresy. Were it not for his ever-present psychic voice reaching out, searching, protecting and planning, then the Imperium of Man would undoubtedly fall back into dark oblivion, and perhaps the light would be extinguished permanently. The Emperor was injured so badly after the heresy that he now exists only as a husk of a man within a stasis chamber called the Golden Throne. This allows him to live on eternally as he has done for some past 10,000 years whilst continually guiding mankind through psychic whispers. The only catch with this is thousands of psychers are sacrificed every day using their essence and psychic power to keep him alive as he is heavily protected and attended to back on the ancient homeworld of legend terror or old earth. The Imperium of Man in the wider galaxy now consists of many systems, planets and trillions of citizens. All the while the Imperial military and the many administrators of mankind, all of whom swear allegiance to the Emperor, all stand together against the nightmares of the galaxy to form what is humanity in the darkest of futures.
Now we know that in this future we have access to highly advanced technology and face many voracious enemies wielding our own forces to then counter them. The important question in understanding the Imperium is how did we get to this time? And to understand this, we need to look back at the extensive and dark history of humanity. There is a small clue as to the way in which the people that constitute humanity in the 41st millennium view their past. That is, the Imperial Two-Headed Eagle, the crest of the Imperium. It stands with its two heads, but with one eye closed. Blind, or perhaps refusing to see the past. The other eye is open, looking to the future. The logic being that the past of humanity is too painful or dangerous to look back on, so we look forward, striving to be stronger and more powerful, as we have done for thousands of years. There are distinct ages of humanity's history, and these tell the story of how we reached the time of the Imperium. One millennium equals 1,000 years. The Imperium has now been established for 10 millennia or 10,000 years. Humanity has existed for roughly 41,000 years. This timeline demonstrates the ages of man through this period from our ancient history through to the age of the Imperium. We have the ancient history, the age of terror, the golden age of technology or the dark age of technology, the age of strife, the unification wars, the Great Crusade and the fall of the Eldar, the Horus Heresy and the Great Scouring, followed by the final Age of Imperium of Man. The ancient history tells of the dawn of mankind, but this period is largely one of animalistic evolution. The most significant event occurs around 7000 BC. This event marks the birth of the humanoid, who would become the emperor of mankind. His origins are something of a heated debate among the 40k community. There are several theories around this, and it's important to note that something I rarely see stated on uh, forums or discussions around the origins of the emperor is that quite simply no one knows the origins of the emperor. It's all just speculation. Simply because one theory has had a vague reference at one time or another does not make it gospel. In fact, as I've repeated before, the crux of the matter with imperial history and law in general is that very little should ever be considered official or canon. Uh, such is the state of the loss of history, misinformation and suppression of facts within the 40k universe. So essentially, the correct version is the version you want to believe. In a universe where history is stored over thousands of years and in times of unimaginable devastation and strife, it's unlikely something could be considered a cold, hard fact, especially when you're talking about events that happened in ancient history in an age where accurate recording of information seems unlikely or even impossible to have survived. The first version of these events is the often widely accepted background which states that in the ancient times some humans carried a natural affinity or awareness of the warp. These were the earliest psychers. They would be village shamans or witch doctors in ancient communities. Their premonitions led them to understand that in the future mankind would face the darkest of times. Their decided course of action would be to commit ritual suicide en masse, returning their souls and essence to the warp to then coalesce and be reborn as one supremely powerful psychic being. This being would then spend the future millennia living a Highlander-like existence, transitioning from identity to identity, sometimes taking on famous leaders in history to steer humanity in the right direction. And then upon reaching the Age of Strife, he would step into the Four to become the supreme leader of all humanity and unite us again throughout the galaxy. Now some people take this as the most canon version of the Emperor's origin, but there are various others, including the one that I actually personally subscribe to. The Shaman story is all very well and good, but it leaves me with some questions. For example, if these Shaman were some of the earliest humans with only a vague awareness of the warp, how could they have such powerful precognition to foresee the need to create such a super being? In addition to that, if they were truly the earliest stowings of psychers for humanity, then surely they would not have been especially powerful, and even with their powers combined, uh, how could they summon humanity's greatest champion? No, not Captain Planet. So, those two things stand out for me. Also, their plan to commit mass suicide and then hope that they would all be reborn together seems pretty spurious. It seems to tick the boxes from an okay, I guess that's possible point of view, but it just doesn't make sense beyond that. Another theory is that the Emperor was in fact one of the Old Ones, who you will remember were one of the most ancient super beings who created the Eldar, the Orcs and even humanity, 
Yes, really, uh, go and look it up for those naysayers who think that they did not. This theory, again, at first is captivating, until you start to think about it more. And then you realise it doesn't really make any sense. The old ones were, as far as we are informed, uh, not shapeshifters, but creatures of light and dark. There was a statement to the fact that just a single old one escaped the brutal genocide of their race, but then was eventually killed at the birth of Slanesh when the Eldar fell. If the Emperor was some other escaped old one, it doesn't make logical sense that they would choose one race and then ultimately lead it. Although I suppose, devil's advocate, who's to say what would be going in the mind of this old one after his entire race was extinguished? Maybe it had a crisis of conscience. Anything, I guess, is possible. And then not to mention also the fact that the Emperor would lead humanity to wage war on pretty much every other alien race which wouldn't really serve any purpose within the context of an Old One's mission statement. They were originally life givers, they seeded planets with life to you know, create new races in the universe. And again, unless it had simply lost the, you know, the plot and uh, was operating on his own sort of mission plan. There are some things that do fit this theory though, such as Old Ones being very powerful psychic creatures, they had extended precognition, they had a very extensive, almost immortal long life, and they would have the ability to genetically manipulate humans. But all of this seems very soft and is only plausible at best. For me, this theory just doesn't really fit. So the last theory, and the one that I personally believe, is that the Emperor was neither the creation of some bizarre suicide pact or an Old One, rather something in between. It's fair to say that in any ancient history nothing is quite as it's written, and that some reading between the lines is necessary. The most ancient of history available hints that the last remaining old one floated around the galaxy, meddling and dabbling and trying to have some last impact on the worlds which they felt they had failed and left their race completely annihilated. We know that the Old Ones were capable of creating beings of immense psychic power. This is how the ancient Eldar defeated the Necrons and Satan, who were, well, let's not forget, gods capable of devouring stars. So the theory I stand by is that a fragmented remaining Old One drifted around the galaxy until he was struck by a precognition so terrible that he had no choice but to resolve becoming involved. It could be that he saw the vision of the Eldar fall or the rise of chaos. Either way, he knew that the Eldar were by now far too arrogant to accept any help and would be of no use, remembering that the Eldar had turned their backs on the Old Ones long ago. The Orcs, who were also uh, an Old Ones creation, they were too crass and mindless for such preparation. Instead, he would turn to the weak humans. Weak, but with great potential. And so he would decide on forming a divine creature, a humanoid of the most immense power, but birthed in such a way that he would not allow those humans would not immediately view him as a god, but as a man, to be not worshipped, but instill a sense of power, of awe, of destiny. There are other clues as well, apparently further along in Earth's ancient history, a creature crashed to Earth who had an appearance we would describe as a dragon. It would seem though that this dragon was in fact a small fragment of the star gods, the Satan, who had been destroyed thousands of light years away by the Necrons. Even a tiny fragment of these most powerful beings would be beyond the means of even the most powerful humans to contain. The future emperor in this time wounded this creature and then apparently took it to Mars, I'm not sure how, um, but there it lay imprisoned within the planet. The final chapter of that story, that's one for another day. Still though, this helps to secure the idea that no mere reincarnation of a few shaman could produce such or, or perform such a task. Could an old one? Perhaps. But given the other evidence, I would still discount it. But a perfectly designed humanoid of godlike form created by an old one who would know a most powerful psychic being was needed to counter not just the future darkness of man, but to face again the Satan and the Day of Reckoning when the Necrons would rise again. This seems for me the most logical and plausible of origins. The truth though is that we cannot know the origin of the Emperor unless some definitive tome is discovered which provides secure evidence as to such, so we are left to speculate until then. One thing that is certain though is that the Emperor was a human and holds godlike psychic power. 
He was within humanity throughout all of history, learning, sometimes guiding, mostly sitting in the shadows, until he was needed to take a course of action that would lead us into the Age of the Imperium. The last point worthy of mention is that the Emperor of Man would enforce a strictly secular society. In the early days of the Imperium, um, this would then enable humanity would identify with him as a man and not as a god. They wouldn't project any religious connotations onto him. Also, because throughout the thousands of years he spent on Earth, he would see the terrible devastation and fragmentation organized religion could cause. He believed that humanity could only achieve its full potential in a strictly secular state. However, even in the crusading period where the emperor would reunite the lost colonies of man, some people began to spread rumors that he was more than just a powerful man. These beliefs would run so strong, it would even question some Astartes to the faith, such as Battle Captain Nathaniel Garrow, one of my favorite characters in the 40k and one of the few space marines from the Death Guard chapter not to be corrupted by chaos. Some citizens of the Imperium consider the Emperor's stance on faith even a test so as to distinguish those who can see the whole of the truth, that he is in fact the one true God of mankind. We would now reach the time known as the Age of Terror. This was the period on Earth from the 1st to the 15th millennia, that is the first 15,000 years on old Earth. A period of extreme technological expansion, from a pre-industrial era to that of fusion power and travel beyond our planet and even solar system. Humanity would first colonize new worlds within our system, first on Mars and then the moons of Jupiter, before mankind would start to look at how we could travel beyond. To achieve this next goal, colossal starships were created for humanity to cross the voids between solar systems and powerful engines at this time, these advanced fusion drives enabled very very fast but still sub-light travel. This meant in order to reach their destination it could take anything as long as 10 generations of human lifespan to reach their destinations. Subsequently, trade and aid between human colonies was then extremely difficult and would lead to them being established almost as independent states. Very little is known of this period as imperial records are fragmented and limited. The emperor during this time had no reason to interfere and so would continue his own work and research back on earth. Study and the improvement of man all the while remaining in the shadows. During the period between the 1st and 15th millennium, various events of discovery and importance took place that would finally propel us to create our first interstellar confederation in the 15th millennium. One of the most important events of note would be during M4. Humanity would discover the warp and begin to research it. This is specifically relevant as it would have been one of the discoveries that would lead the Emperor to understanding the necessity of him coming into the fore. As we reach the 15th millennium, humanity would enter a golden age of technology. This would be the highest point in mankind's technological achievements. It would last for some 10,000 years and humanity continued its rise in technology, science and power, spreading and colonizing mankind all across the Milky Way galaxy. We could create our first galactic empire, ruled from Earth, the homeworld, and establish massive trade networks that further powered expansion and advancement. This earlier period in the Age of Technology has a subtitle known as the Stellar Exodus. This marks the time when humanity made its first colonies on other worlds, and also beyond the solar system. These initial colonies were reached using the ships that were still only capable of sublight speeds and were restricted by this, as well as our developing but limited knowledge of building these vast scale ships. When these ships reach their destination though, they would be then slowly deconstructed and the materials used to build the colonies. Some would become manufactorums capable of producing massive war machines, or then back then defensive machines, things such as imperial knights and even titans which the colonies would use to defend themselves against the dangers of the galaxy. 
In a comparable way to early colonies on Earth, this meant they had to be self-sufficient and due to the large timescales involved before anyone would likely reach out to them again, they would develop their own cultures and languages largely influenced by the noble families established on these interstellar voyages, as well as physical elements on the new homeworld, the planet's characteristics would also shape the way in which their societies would evolve. Now some 6,000 years later, around the period of millennium 21, mankind now began a process of militarization. It is not known who or for what reason created this process or started it off, but along with our expansion and colonization of planets, we also began to expand and develop our weapons and forces. Fragments of what was developed during this age of technology, such as Imperial Knights, Titans, Land Raider designs and so on, would later be recovered by the Imperium far into the future. The largest proportion, however, would be lost to the tides of time, and we can only imagine or hope to continue recovering these lost and most powerful of technologies in the 41st millennium. Humanity had risen to a period of immense power through our technology. And whilst the Emperor of Man existed, he had not made himself known to mankind. He continued to bide his time, lying in the shadows, studying, planning, observing. The very fact that the Emperor is one of the few who would live through this time and on into the age of the Imperium, and this would then have far-reaching implications for humanity, as the Emperor would carry his knowledge and strength of this golden age into a time when none would recall it, and where it would be of critical importance to our survival. For the Emperor, he would use this knowledge of the Age of Technology to bring humanity back to a glimmer of what once had been. In the thousands of years where humanity established its first interstellar empire, we would become, as much as the Eldar, supremely dependent on technology. Humankind had risen to a level of godlike understanding, and this was embraced and practiced by the people of the time. The empire of mankind was seen as a bastion of technological achievement and began to use a new class of humans entitled the Navigators to expand our reach and use the newly discovered warp to travel beyond the distances of existing star drives and cover vast distances in a short time. A navigator's role is to, as the name suggests, protect and guide a ship through the tides and dangers of the warp. Eventually, over time, humanity would find the warp had become too turbulent to traverse. But in this time, navigators, uh, they're not strictly psychers as such. They possess a special gene called, unsurprisingly, the navigator gene. They also possess other abnormal characteristics, including a third eye in the forward head, uh, as well as some more alien appearances, such as no pupils in their human eyes and translucent skin, as well as maybe larger than normal appendages. Their origin is believed to have not been a natural development, but to have come about through genetic experimentation and engineering in this period of the age of technology. It was likely that mankind discovered the warp and that it could be utilised for crossings, but that required a safe means to traverse it and looked to create a solution to that problem. Mankind's age of expansion and technological glory across the galaxy would lead to many worlds requiring their own localised defence forces. In this time, humanity's mastery of technology was largely unequaled, and this would be employed in the defence and relative growth of the colonies. One of these defence forces, uh, one of the most powerful of them, would be the Imperial Knights. These were colossal war machines that towered over all they surveyed on a battlefield. They were built with the knowledge of the Golden Age of Technology, and these giants survived until the Imperial Age, but they can essentially no longer be constructed from scratch, and as is often the case with technology in the Imperium, it is now merely maintained. The Imperial Knights themselves were operated by nobles from the colony worlds who would be entombed within them. They are sworn to protect their citizens from all Xenos threats and the endless nightmares in the universe. As the Knights would advance into the later ages, they continued their noble values and morals. Some of the Knights are the most selfless and dedicated forces within the Imperium, as well as being some of the oldest. As with most technology from the Dark or Golden Age of technology, the Knights are immensely powerful, allowing them to run and fight as much as a Dreadnought would fight, but on a much larger scale. These ancient heroes have fought thousands of battles across millennia and stand ready to defend Imperial citizens and support Astartes anywhere in the galaxy. 
After the knights we have the titans, and titans are the epic war machines of the Imperium. A knight and the smallest titan can be anything like 9-10 meters, but the big titans can be anything up to 50 meters. They are gargantuan death machines. Many people believe that the Mechanicum were originally responsible for creating the Titans. This is not strictly correct. They do construct some Titans, but many they simply maintain. This is because the technology used to create Titans is very, very old. And like many things in the universe of Warhammer 40,000 for the Imperium, a lot of technology is merely maintained because of its complexity. Uh, simpler devices are constructed, but this happens less and less. But the Mechanicum do create some titans for the Imperium. Originally, the Mechanicus found versions that were completely autonomous, created in the Golden Age of Technology. And the largest titan so far discovered was upon the lost forge world of Charania. It was a completely autonomous war machine and was dubbed the Castigator class titan. Its schematic was apparently also contained within a standard template construct on this planet and it was far superior to any class of titan utilized by the Adeptus Mechanicus or any other intelligent race in the galaxy. This was so far the only known discovered Castigator class titan but it was subsequently destroyed by Imperial Grey Knights. Grey Knights are the secretive and unbreakable order of Astartes warriors dedicated to the protection of the Imperium from the very darkest foes that humanity faces in the 41st millennium. Now the portion of the STC database containing the data for the manufacture of the Castigator class Titan was also destroyed by the Mechanicus. It possessed AI, which is strictly outlawed and heretical within the Imperium. Secondly, it had somehow long ago been corrupted by living chaos energy, and for this reason it could obviously no longer be supported. Imperial records of this event though note that the cost of life and resources required to destroy this Titan monstrosity were severe. The key point here though is that mankind was developing machines in the golden age of technology that would never again be equaled. They could be merely copied, emulated or used as a template to work from in the future. But our level of knowledge, our rules and guides on what could be created due in part to events that were yet to come would very much limit humanity's advancement in the millennia that lay ahead. I mentioned a moment ago something called an STC. This denotes a device known as a standard template construct. These are one of the single most valuable objects in the galaxy for the Imperium, and their importance was no less during the Age of Technology. So what is an STC? STC systems were advanced AI computers created during the Golden or Dark Age of Technology, and are said to have contained the sum total of human, scientific and technological knowledge. STCs were created when human interstellar civilization was at its technological peak. Their original purpose was to enable colonists to survive on the new worlds they arrived upon, as they could not carry securely the mass amount of knowledge gained by humanity at this time, and even if they could, they might not have people capable of understanding how to utilize this. The STC solved this problem, it enabled the colonies to access all of humanity's knowledge and display it in a way for them to be able to create anything they needed from the resources available and solve any issue that could arise for them on the new home worlds, no matter the geography, resource limitations or climate. This would enable them to build anything from a simple las gun to a fortified bunker, massive war machines or an atmospheric processor. STC systems possess the ability to not just store information but also to produce new designs to meet changing circumstances. They are immensely powerful sources of information and power and consequently the Imperium places a high value on obtaining these lost relics of ancient knowledge. Even though now after many thousands of years had passed, most of the discovered STCs are damaged to the point they only contain fragments of their former stored information. But Imperial forces will still use any means or resources necessary to obtain an STC once it has been discovered, even if this means the sacrifice of legions of military or civilian Imperial citizens. From the golden age of technology and into the ages to come, these valuable systems will be lost or destroyed, so that now in the age of the Imperium, they have become beyond rare, almost just a legend. So the consequent discovery of remnants of any new technology from the dark age of technology puts an STC's value to humanity beyond estimation. 
the little knowledge that has been recovered from damaged STC units is then utilised, copied and stored by the tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus, who are based deep on the primary forge homeworld of Mars. They believe that STCs are the most holy of artefacts and will seek and protect them at any cost. This little divergence is an important one because an STC recovery, no matter its state of repair, still remains as one of the most important objectives for Imperial forces in the 41st millennium. The holy grail of this quest though, although unlikely, would be to recover an intact STC, thereby gifting the Imperium all of the stored knowledge of mankind from the golden age of technology. If the Imperium were able to recover an STC of this standard, it would catapult the existing human society into becoming yet again one of the most advanced and significantly, if not the most powerful state in the galaxy. The STC Crusade also explains in part about the state of technology and development of the Imperium in that much of the knowledge regarding tech is replicated or learned rather than invented and created. Although new tech does come along, it's not overtly specified why so little resources are put into research now. It could be speculated though, however, that mankind relied so strongly upon the Emperor in the last 10 millennia that now they believe he only he is capable of directing mankind's advancement and they solely focus on maintaining him and maintaining the state of Imperial Affairs. So we return to our story and at this time in the golden age of technology humanity continues to expand across the galaxy. Initially slowly as the gigantic starships we crafted were incapable of using the warp to traverse space and as we learned previous they took generations to reach their destination. They were essentially travelling worlds similar to the Eldar craft world of the 41st millennium. When these ships reached their destination they would slowly be deconstructed and their materials could be used to create massive war machines such as the Imperial Knights and Titans which the colony could use to defend themselves against the dangers of the galaxy. Dangers such as the Eldar and Orcs who were first discovered in this period as a result of our reaching out beyond our own system to more regularly explore the galaxy. However, interestingly, during this time humanity was actually considered more powerful than it is in the 41st millennium. This strength was mainly due to our technology rather than actual physical forces such as Astartes who did not exist in this age. Science was humanity's primary religion and the society of man perceived itself as having reached a time where no one could be a real challenge to us. To a degree this was actually true, so much so that the Xenos races of Eldar and Orc actually signed non-aggression pacts with mankind, which seems bizarre from the Orc point of view, but there we are. The discovery and use of interstellar drives, that is an engine enabling cross warp travel, now powered humanity's expansion and domination of the galaxy forward. A federated government was formed enabling us to create a strong trade community and most importantly remain unified and powerful throughout our colonies spread across the galaxy, aiding and supporting where necessary with either materials, logistics or military. The exact form and nature of this federation is unknown from this time as so much knowledge and history was lost. To speculate though, it seems likely that from the way in which humans would live at this time, the federation would have focused more on discovery, science and working to better humanity as well as supporting our widespread colonies. As the societies we had seeded across the galaxy grew stronger and more developed, most humans would live long peaceful lives where menial actions were carried out by automation, leaving people time to indulge in their own lives and dedicate themselves to the glorious expansion of mankind. This golden age of peace bears a stark contrast to the unforgiving brutality of the 41st millennium, the Imperium where many citizens are now born into lives that are shorter, work driven and even hellish by comparison. Back with our timeline though, and although navigators had now been discovered and enabled interstellar travel, psychers, that is humans with strong psychic ability, had for the longest time evaded or simply passed undetected. It would be in the age of technology where this new class of human would finally be identified. These psychers seemingly largely avoided the demonic possessions which had occurred for the old ones, orc and elder. 
It is unclear why this would be, but again you may speculate that the Emperor had a role to play in guiding and shielding humanity through this time. As we know, he had always lain in the shadows, ensuring our safety and creating small influence until he felt it was necessary to come to the fore. Another possibility is that by comparison, the Orcs and Eldar with their more advanced psychic powers simply shone brighter. As we know, the demons of the warp are actually attracted to psychic power in real space, like moths to a lamp, and so they appeared amid the depths of the galaxy, a brighter beacon for the chaotic creatures to be attracted towards, whereas the human psychers were very early in development, their powers were less attractive, they did not stand out so much. These psychic mutations were initially limited to only a few individuals per billion or so humans, but toward the end of the Age of Technology, psychers would appear throughout the colonies more widespread than ever before. And some colonies who were advanced and open-minded, they could see the potential advantages brought by human psychers, and they were protected and allowed to develop and explore their abilities. However, on other, less advanced human colonies, they were often killed and hunted down as the people here feared rather than embraced their divergent powers, much of you know, similar to witch hunt. As I hinted at earlier, one of the reasons during the golden age of technology that humanity was able to not only survive, but stretch itself out to colonize and conquer worlds in the galaxy, not to mention defending itself against aggressive Xenos, would be due to their reliance on AI and the machine creations of the time. However, as nearly all science fiction dictates, these primary sentient machines in the Human Galactic Federation would be known as the Men of Iron, and they would stereotypically turn on their creators and enter us into a cataclysmic war. An STC containing a template for the Men of Iron was discovered by Imperial forces on a chaos-controlled world. It became apparent that much as the Castigator-class Titan, the Men of Iron here had also been corrupted by chaos, and the AI of these creations was sentient. So we can perhaps speculate that the Men of Iron initially resented their human creators, but combined with this, were also corrupted, possibly by chaos, which at the time was relatively unknown to mankind, hence the lack of any documentation to support such speculation. It is, however, a possibility and stacks up with what we know of the corruptibility of human AI creations. Also, the intent of the Dark Forces of Chaos to obliterate humanity once it became aware of its existence. Regardless of the reason though, this war was one of the greatest disasters to befall humanity and would rage for centuries. The exact length of the war is not recorded. The conflict was eventually won by humanity, but at a great cost. The damage caused by this conflict to interstellar human society was hugely destructive. We would lose masses of knowledge and technology, not to mention devastating humanity's economic strength and political unity. The war would begin the series of events that would lead into the collapse of the Federation of Humanity at the end of the Age of Technology. As so often is the case, very little information exists from this time, largely due to the Imperium being so wary of a similar disaster happening again. And this is why, amongst the Imperium of mankind, you'll find only the simplest forms of AI. It is viewed as being exceptionally dangerous technology, and is strictly outlawed. A substitute is often to combine human and machine into mindless drone-like beings known as servitors. Servitors are the Imperium's cybernetic servants, lacking true self-awareness and are created from the bodies of either condemned criminals who are unpleasantly lobotomized, or vat-grown humanoids whose bodies and brains are partially replaced with machine systems. As a result of this catastrophic conflict between the men of iron and humanity in the golden age of technology, it is now considered one of the most severe crimes in Imperial society to develop a self-aware artificially intelligent machine. It is just considered too dangerous to even consider. Around Millennium 23, the warp was taking hold of psychers and wreaking havoc on human colonies. Feudal night worlds were more conservative and less abiding of psychers, as we said previously, who had hunted them down. These would fare better than the others who had adopted them more open-mindedly at the time. The knights in their semi-titan armour would battle massive warp entities and serve to protect the planet's human population, abiding to their strict code of feudal discipline and ability. 
very often they would be the bastions that protected mankind's worlds and their importance cannot be underestimated at this time. As is often the case in history, it is not one but a series of disasters that leads to total ruination, and this was no exception for the glorious empire humanity had established during the Dark Age of Technology. Whilst it was struggling to recover from a collapse in its unity, as well as destruction of many of its resources, and its ability to trade efficiently with other worlds, a new disaster would occur that would see the end of humanity's golden age and instead throw us further into near total annihilation. The race of man would never again reach this golden pinnacle of technological achievement. As we learned in ancient Eldar lore, it was at this time that the Eldar out in the galaxy would fall into near total destruction. These would be dark days indeed as the Eldar were almost wiped out in a cataclysmic annihilation as the chaos god Slanesh was born into existence from the horrifically depraved mire that Eldar society had fallen into. This was a disaster for the Eldar, nearly extinguishing their light from the universe completely, but it didn't do humanity any favours either. The near destruction of the Eldar and birth of Slanesh only came to mark the end of the Age of Strife. What caused it prior to these events was the ever-expanding sea of psychic energy known as the Warp. For many millennia, this had been growing more and more powerful, fueled by the nightmarish depravity that was Eldar society. Around the end of Millennium 24 and the beginning of 25, mankind was still struggling to recover from the disastrous war against its Men of Iron and its far-reaching impact on the previously secure and strong Human Federation. With their galactic unity destroyed, as well as suffering from the inevitable wounds of war, material shortages, mass loss of life and destruction of infrastructure, we would now face a new problem. Warp travel was becoming increasingly difficult. The warp's instability, caused in part by the Eldar's depraved psychic society, meant that many ships now would become lost and consumed by the warp as they were travelling through. This was not an issue for the Eldar themselves, as they used their webways to travel, which you know were outside of what that warp space. For humanity, though, it would be a severe problem, and its impact would deal the fatal blow to an already fragile empire. The losses and damage caused by the war with the Men of Iron, combined with now being unable to travel across the warp to cross those great distances in the galaxy, would ultimately return humanity to a pre-Dark Age of Technology state, where only sublight travel was possible. This was a disaster. Trade and support could no longer be conducted, as these journeys would now take generations to complete. Humanity was once again isolated, as it had been millennia before. The warp storms and the isolation they would create would last for over 5,000 years and their effect on human society across the galaxy was catastrophic. Some planets with a significantly advanced human colony would survive into the future if they had the means to defend and support themselves. It's important to understand that when a system is set up with no established backup, its collapse has an immediate and profound impact. This was the case with mankind's trade system. It had grown over time to enable many planets to survive solely on imports from other rich parts of the Human Federation. Without this infrastructure and no way to gain outside support, disaster was inevitable. Many would turn inwardly to the colony, consuming themselves from the inside out, first with barbaric civil war and later total anarchy, fighting over the scarce resources that remained. The final phase often led the significantly depleted population into a feudal system of warlords and barbarism. This chaos was repeated across the majority of human worlds in this period, even including Earth. At this time on Earth, large areas across the planet had become massive cities reaching for hundreds of miles and having become adapted to a system where all activities were conducted by machines, Earth also now relied heavily 
on trade from colonized worlds to support the extremely high population count. Additionally, much of the planet was no longer capable of food production and hadn't been for millennia, hence the need for colonies and expansion in the first place. With the inability to travel and trade, Earth descended into a similar fate of the less advanced worlds, first panic and general disorder, then food riots, resource hoarding, and finally, complete anarchy. A tribal warlord system was all that remained of the few survivors left on Earth, brutal warriors who battled out across the deserts and hives of the remnants of civilization. This whole situation might sound unbelievable that society could collapse so quickly and to such a severe degree, but it's worth considering that in this time, human society had built itself up to be so strong in belief of its own invincibility that they simply did not and could not have anticipated the severity of the warp storms or how they would debilitate the trade and support systems that they had been relying upon. Human history is littered with examples of sheer arrogance outweighing logic and reason, as well as blindly staring down dangerous facts in favour of belief in our own self-importance. The lack of planning when it comes to losing their infrastructure across human systems was an acute example of human arrogance. It would now seem as well that whatever had protected human psychers from demonic possession would now end. It's my speculation that as previously stated, the Emperor was what provided this shielding, even though he was not known to humanity at this time. For he knew the power, importance and value of human psychers in the dark times that would lie ahead. Without this bubble of protection that had invisibly existed prior to this time, humanity's weak psychers would be consumed, possessed and go completely insane, causing chaos among isolated, colonized worlds. This period of complete anarchy would last for some 5,000 years, and during this time, many colonies would forget their family out in the galaxy, as well as losing vast amounts of technology and knowledge. Only fragments of the glory of humanity would remain, preserved on the advanced worlds who were capable to survive this dark time. By the 28th millennium, almost all traces of civilization on Earth were gone. Instead, techno-barbarians battled one another over the scraps of the ancient human race. Mars, however, was one of the few worlds to undergo a different process. After a brief period of anarchy, the tech priests of the cult Mechanicus emerged victorious over the Psyker mutants and then unified their homeworld. The priests visited Earth, but upon seeing its barren destruction, wrote it off as unsalvageable. They used any titans they had to help them in the future reunification of man. They would also be one of the few worlds to reach out and recolonize planets in this time. Using their knowledge of the warp, they chose moments of calm amid the storms of the time in the warp to travel through and establish new forge worlds. These were replicas of the tech homeworld of Mars and enabled them to continue support and recovery of the technology of man, as well as production of munitions and simpler war machines. But for humanity, its golden age was over. This dark age of technology had fallen apart catastrophically. Many of the weapons that once served mankind brought us to near destruction and turned lush garden worlds into irradiated deserts mechanical factory worlds into dystopian nightmares, beautifully advanced and artistic colonies turned into barbaric, nightmarish hells devoid of all morality. The age of strife was upon mankind, and only the further darkness of the future lay ahead. Roughly 5,000 years later, around the period of millennium 30 to 31, human society had reached a state of pitiful decay after cannibalizing itself for millennia. The Eldar had also reached the peak of their social decay, and so heralded the agonizing birth of the Chaos God Slanesh, who would consume the majority of their population in one cataclysmic event that brought Eldar society to the brink of extinction. This horrific event, though, would have a positive outcome for mankind. It consumed all of that stored, turbulent warp energy. So after thousands of years of instability, the warp returned to relative calm. Interstellar communication and travel would once again be possible for the civilization of mankind. So the Age of Strife was coming to an end. But before we move forward, we need to move back some 2,000 years to M28 to M30. 
Humanity had now come close to the brink of destruction itself. So many worlds had fallen into disarray, starvation, chaos, anarchy. Now was the time. This would be the time where the mysterious and powerful Psyker who had wandered amongst humanity for thousands of years would come to the fore to lead humanity from an edge of unsalvageable darkness back into the light and resume their place as a meaningful power in the galaxy. Earth had by now been reduced to a chemically irradiated barren wasteland. Its population slaughtered and all that remained were degenerate feral nomads fighting for irrelevant territories. Insane wandering prophets and cyber augmented techno barbarians who lived for nothing other than to fight, created in the cradle of world ending war. Frail empires would rise and disintegrate as quickly and forgettably as they had risen. No tribe or faction had enough power or resources to make any meaningful stand, and so it went on, pathetic fighting over the remnants of a ravaged world. Out of this seemingly endless horror came a single man, a warlord like no other. His title in these early days is unknown, but we would know who he would rise to become, the Emperor of Man. He would first conquer and then rebuild humanity, leading it into the light, saving it from itself to form his autocracy known as the Imperium of Mankind. Unlike so many before him though, he had power not only as an unstoppable warrior, but in many other traits such as rational thinking, tactics, philosophy, economics, compassion, foresight, and perhaps most importantly, a genius of science, everything and more that would be required for a supreme leader. The Emperor though fought not for selfish personal gain or bloodlust of war like all the other scattered remnants of humanity left on earth. He had selfless, higher goals to restore humanity spiritually, intellectually and physically to revert us to a time of strength and prosperity. These were the years of the Unification Wars. The Emperor had long held a facility deep in a range of mountains previously known as the Himalayas. This was his most significant stronghold and would later become the Imperial Palace. Here he experimented with genetics as well as developing and constructing weapons and armour for his warriors. In the earliest days he would physically and genetically augment some of the most powerful barbarians. These humanoids would become known as the Thunder Warriors. The very first of their kind and the most basic template for what would eventually become the Imperial Space Marines, the Astartes, the greatest warriors in the galaxy. Under unsurmountable pressure from the Emperor's army of Thunder Warriors, the barbaric factions fell quickly and humanity was united on Old Earth for the first time in centuries. This however would come at a terrible cost for the Thunder Warriors themselves and is one of the least known yet darkest events for mankind. In order to unify Earth and bring humanity back on the path of advancement and strength, the Emperor had found it necessary to in part cleanse the savagery that had grown on the war-torn planet. This sadly meant the death of many arguable innocents during the Unification Wars as well as the eradication of the last remaining religious church on Earth known as the Church of the Lightning Stone. The Emperor is known to have personally spoken to the last remaining priest before bringing in his new age of enforced secular rationalism and the ideology known as the Imperial Truth. This essentially tells that humanity are now those destined to be the rulers of the galaxy. The Eldar had their chance and failed and now humanity are the best set to take their place as the dominant force. This ideology would soon be brought to all the scattered worlds of humanity in the long crusade that was yet to come. Now the official version of things tells how the last battle of the Unification Wars takes place on Mount Ararat. This siege to cleanse the last of the Techno Barbarians from the ruined wastes on Earth and finally bring it back to a time of peace and growth was said to be so brutal that waves of Thunder Warriors fell against the rocks in resistance were slain to a single man, the legendary warrior Arik Taranis, the Lightning Bearer. He would raise the banner of lightning to mark the end of the Unification Wars, setting in place the rule of the Emperor of Man, before he too would fall to fatal wounds suffered in this battle of legend. 
as with many things, the official version is not the end of the story. The actuality of the event was darker and far more sinister. The Emperor knew that in order to restore peace, growth and a sense of civilization to his new and expanding empire, he would require a more stable and balanced force than the Thunder Warriors, who were essentially just adept brutes recruited from the wasteland, albeit clad in the earliest Imperial armor. In a necessary betrayal, the Emperor realized that in order to safeguard what he had achieved, his army of barbaric fighters could not exist past this time. It is believed that he actually ordered the many Thunder Warriors who had survived the final battle to be slaughtered by his elite guard and possibly even some of the early proto-Astartes who were at this time far advanced beyond most of his standard force. This terrible secret has been concealed from the people of the Imperium for more than 10,000 years, and were it ever to be revealed, the consequences could be unimaginably disastrous. The Emperor, though, saw this necessary evil had to come to pass for the greater good, a sacrifice of the few to save the many who would come. The Thunder Warriors were built for war, and war alone, and would not be able to adapt to a time of peace, and could even have turned a vital tool into a dangerous, unstable threat that could unbalance all that he had achieved. In order for the next stage of his plans, he also required that humanity rally behind him as the sole and most powerful force. The slaughter of the Thunder Warriors was not the last act of betrayal though by the Emperor. He would then take the necessary glory that he had near single-handedly reunified terror. This distortion of the truth, while hugely distasteful, does appear largely necessary to reunite the whole of humanity and create the most powerful civilization in the galaxy. Nonetheless, should the truth ever arise, it would at best split apart the Imperium and at worst destroy it. These choices by the Emperor are important to remember in the context of his character, as it can lead to certain logical speculations regarding future events. Some Thunder Warriors though would find fate on their side and escape this mass killing and live on as homeless unknowns seeking out a miserable existence at the bottom of society. Honours forgotten, their deeds meaningless, all the while fearing constant discovery from the Imperium and certain death. This heartless betrayal was surely one of the darkest periods in Imperial history. They were never hunted though in any significant way. The Emperor believed them all dead and besides they were far more important tasks at hand as the Emperor now gathered a team of gene rights salvaged from the few remaining humans on earth. These were men with practical knowledge of genetics to aid in his development of the new Astartes project. Those Thunder Warriors who did escape were not like the Astartes of the 41st millennium. They were genetically unstable and most significantly they only had a minimally extended mortality beyond that of a regular human, unlike the space marines who can live on for thousands of years. The Emperor had been working for decades on his Astartes project, deep within his mountain facility. Here he would create the vital foundations that would springboard humanity into a new age. His experiments would create the 20 Space Marine Legions, known as the Legiones Astartes, as well as 20 Primarchs to lead each Legion. These 20 supreme leaders of the soon-to-come Space Marine Legions were crafted by the Emperor using samples of his own arcane genetic code as the base. It is obviously unknown the depth of which the Emperor used his own DNA to create the Primarchs, but later findings through ancient Imperial records do hint that he spliced multiple DNA types together, even going so far as to introduce some animal DNA into the Primarchs. And this would explain why some, such as Lehman Russ, would display the wolf-like qualities and why these would then become present throughout the Space Wolves uh, Legion and Chapter. It's difficult to speculate on the Emperor's true goals here, and even if he was successful in the mixing of DNA in this way, it seems highly experimental, and perhaps he himself was not sure of the final result. This period of intelligent design was hasty and somewhat improvised given the dire situation facing mankind. It needed to repopulate its military power in order to springboard and take stage fights forward uh, to reconquer the colonies. Another point of speculation is how closely the Primarchs were imbued with spiritual elements and others such as unnaturally skillful charisma and so on. 
Still though, in creating the Primarchs and even taking small elements of the Emperor's DNA, it imbued them with these demi-godlike characteristics. It also explains why at this time, the barely known forces of chaos would seek out and scatter the developing Primarchs before the Emperor's plans could grow into fruition. Little is known of this Primarch scattering event, but it has been suggested that the dawning forces of chaos felt this expanding power from humanity to threaten them, and in an effort to slow or negate it, they reached out into the mortal world to seize and scatter the fetal Primarchs across the galaxy. Each world they found themselves on would surely in time come to realise that they were far from normal, often finding themselves as a natural leader in command of the systems that would become their home. Later the Emperor would one by one discover and reunite the Primarchs with their legions, establishing one of the most powerful military forces the galaxy had ever seen. The Thunder Warriors though were undoubtedly the early prototypes for the Astartes project, which subsequently makes their untimely end all the more tragic, as their sacrifice was so great, yet the memory of them was totally obliterated. The Astartes project would continue in a pragmatic manner. Each of the early legions at this time contained barely a few hundred marines. Their equipment was lightweight and somewhat improvised by comparison to later standards. They trained their minds and bodies to be the will, might and rule of the emperor. Time would pass and their numbers grew. Each legion was divided not only for organisational reasons but also for practical reasons. Because of their adapted genetics that were drawn from the Primarchs, some carried traits and psychological behaviours which would not have been found comfortable comparison with their sibling legions. This segregation also allowed them to focus their bonds to their brothers in their own legion, creating a near unbreakable kinship between Astartes. If the newly created Astartes would be the Emperor's scalpel, his gleaming pinnacle of human achievement, then the Thunder Warriors were certainly a mace used to bludgeon the remnants of humanity back into submission. The Thunder Warriors were genetically stronger though, tougher, and could even be stronger in battle than the newly created Astartes, which is something people often forget. They were a rough, brutal instrument, but ultimately a temporary solution to a violent problem. The Space Marines would serve not only as a weapon, but as beacons to mankind, a glimmer of what humanity could hope to be. The dark times to come, however, would show that this was a misplaced belief, that while the Space Marines were created to represent the pinnacle of human development, they ultimately proved as susceptible to the basic flaws of mankind as any other mortal. The Emperor's campaign on Earth would now come to a close. He began establishing the fundamental elements of a civilized modernized society in government administration, economy and infrastructure. An important figure in this process was a man known as Malkador, the Sigilite. He had a vast knowledge of such matters and carried himself with the bearing of a priest. He was appointed to run the courts and palaces of the new empire, the right hand man of the emperor. Earth would turn from a place of desolation and horror to one of active production, rebuilding and planning. Some might call it coincidentally convenient, but at this time a vast shockwave would travel through the galaxy, the birth of Slanesh. Humanity would have no idea of the significance of this, only that it cleared the storms from the warp that had isolated and ruined humanity's gloriously technologically advanced empire. Again though, we could speculate that the Emperor had foreseen these events and the necessity of preparing Earth for this time. On Mars, the humans of the cult Mechanicus, that is those who worship machines, would become aware of this unification on Earth, as information through distant communication and physical observations. They viewed this new emperor as a man in alignment with their own agenda. Mars, during the Dark Age of Technology, had been a planet with a single purpose, a powerhouse of production for this age, consolidating ships and weapons, including the vast titans, hundreds of feet tall, gigantic bipedal war machines whose very presence could end conflicts before they began. Since the end of this age, cults had risen across the Mars, and the most prevalent of these was the Mechanicus, whose ideology included the veneration and acquisition of these ancient but highly advanced technologies from the period known as the Dark Age of Technology. During the period of isolation known as the Age of Strife, Mars had undergone a similar societal collapse comparable to that of Earth. 
with all trade cut off, they had insufficient water and food to supply the populace. A civil war would follow, as well as the collapse of some planetary infrastructures that shielded their little remaining hydroponics and food production systems. This would lead to a further collapse of the already fragile supporting systems. The Tex, an established Mechanicum, decided the best way to survive this apocalypse would be to retreat into underground bunkers which had been mined out, creating vast cities below the surface. Little is known at this time, but evidently prior to their seclusion, the Mechanicum Tex were a cult who would bear a respect and drive to recover, protect and utilise the lost technologies of mankind. Upon their rise from the subterranean depths, they had in this time translated this over into a complete faith. The tech priests of the Mechanicum, along with their troops, would very quickly subdue the insane irradiated savages who remained on the surface and begin the process of rebuilding and redeveloping Mars to be completely self-sufficient. This, in combination with their access to some of the most powerful war machines ever forged in the galaxy, would without doubt leave the Mechanicus in a position of some power. To the cult of Mechanicus, who were now becoming aware of this emperor figure who had surfaced on Terra, a man of science and technology, this was obviously appealing to the Mechanicus, and some tech priests on Mars even began to suggest that the emperor was a man of such power as to rival their own machine god and fulfil an ancient prophecy in their faith of techno-mysticism. Debates raged on Mars between the priesthood regarding how to treat this new development. All the while, the Emperor bearing his power of immense foresight would not be ignorant of the Mechanicum and he slowly and steadily would begin to craft his new plans accordingly. Plans for a crusade on a galactic scale never before seen. Its purpose? To locate the lost Primarchs, to reunite the territories of humanity, forge a new Imperial Empire, and thrust the Imperium of Man into a position of complete dominance and power throughout the galaxy. The Emperor's plan was one of absolute submission. Anyone who stood against the Imperial Truth would be cleansed and destroyed. The Mechanicum of Mars were one of the few exceptions. The Emperor knew that any battle to try and claim dominance over the cult Mechanicum would be hugely counterproductive. Even if he could claim victory over them, the cost to his new Astartes force would be severe and unjustified. So he planned instead to offer a rare alliance with the Council of Tech Priests. In offering them assistance in their own goals and acquisitions of new and lost tech throughout the galaxy, they would provide support, construction of war gear and tech to Imperial forces. They also were one of the exceptional entities to be allowed to maintain a state of semi-independence within the Imperium, a fairly unique position. The Emperor would also provide a new group of navigators to enable the Mechanicum to travel through the warp again in search of fabled STC units. All of this suited the Mechanicum and Imperium in a symbiotic relationship, and an alliance was created. And so we reach the beginning of Millennium 31. With Mars now allied to the Emperor's Imperium, the Legionis Astartes war machine had significantly expanded. The Mechanicum would provide the battle barges needed to transport the space marines throughout the galaxy. They also brought to the table the Titans, some of the most powerful war machines ever created. Their very presence on approaching a humanoid system would often be enough to prevent a conflict. The shock and awe of facing such incomprehensible opponents would quickly lead a populace to understand they had no hope of preventing the Imperial Expeditionary Forces from achieving their goals. The Crusade would initially be led by the Emperor himself as he commanded a massive fleet of Astartes. As the Crusade gathered pace and the Primarchs were recovered, these Expeditionary Fleets would number in the thousands. Before we talk about the Crusade itself though, which I have tried to condense as much as possible, I want to first talk briefly on the Astartes or Space Marines. Now a regular misconception about Space Marines is that because they wear near identical armour and were originally produced via a variation of cloning or at least grown in a lab, 
that they somehow have no personality or little differentiation between them. It is also often assumed that space marines will blindly follow any commands given to the letter, no matter the consequences. After all, they are the superior, unquestioning warriors in the universe, right? Both of these myths is fundamentally wrong. Each space marine is an individual person with their own character, traits, to an extent personal principles. There are many documented events in which these human elements would have a role to play in subsequent events. Space Marines, although superhuman, are still human, and as such the Emperor deemed it necessary to have a senior position with whom Astartes could use as a point of reference to discuss matters of morality, to understand their purpose, their mission, and sometimes to give guidance beyond purely military matters during the Crusade and the Expeditionary Forces. Enter the Iterators. Imperial Iterators were the most persuasive of public speakers. They are masters of manipulating a crowd's opinion, and Iterators would counsel also Marines as they voyaged through the galaxy. But their role went beyond this and was critical at the inception of the Great Crusade. They were placed among the expeditionary forces to aid in reuniting humanity and turning lost human civilizations to the Imperial cause. The Emperor appointed them to spread the Imperial truth. Truths such as the rejection of religious faith to enforce secular rule, and unnecessary wasteful squabbling over power and resources. These were all seen as significantly counterproductive and opposite to the objectives of the Imperium. The first Primarch to be reunited with the Imperial fleet was Horus of the Lunar Wolves. He greatly admired the Iterator's work, so much so that he asked them to also tutor his captains and legionnaires. Horus believed that once the Crusade was completed, there would be an end to the war and that the Astartes would first need to find a peacetime vocation. The most famous Iterator during the Great Crusade was Primary Iterator Kyril Sindeman, who served aboard Horus's flagship. Iterators are seen as the precursors to Imperial Guard Commissars and Astartes Chaplains. The Iterators and then later the Chaplains are an example of the more human services required by Space Marines. Documented records have shown that they have been regularly known to question ethics, purpose and even their own morality, despite an Astartes essentially being immortal. They are destined to die in battle, as that is their true purpose. And despite this predefined fate, they are far from the emotionless drones that some would assume. They are a living embodiment of humanity, a distillation of spirit and mind. The Emperor's Great Crusade to reunify humanity had begun in earnest. This was an operation on a truly epic scale. Millions of troops, tens of thousands of ships forged by the Mars Mechanicum. This would be humanity's defining moment, to reach out and forge the greatest empire in the galaxy. The Imperial forces comprised soldiers, naval officers, and most importantly, the Astartes legions. They were configured and divided into expeditionary fleets supported by all manner of cruisers, transports, scout teams, dropships, and so on commanded by the Emperor and his War Council, but also by individuals placed in charge of these expeditionary forces. It's important to remember that these forces were as much exploratory as they were tasked with an important mission. A great deal of time had passed during the Age of Strife, as well as incalculable quantities of data had been lost in the process. The Imperial forces simply didn't know exactly where all the colonies were, nor their status. Had they been destroyed in civil war, alien genocide, or perhaps the opposite and expanded to a degree where they would not need aid but instead submission. All of these were unknowns, many locations could be estimated as to whether or not they had been colonised in the past. The Mechanicum could provide some information from past scripture as to where human colonies had been located, although more importantly they wanted to know where we could find ancient and undiscovered technology. The expeditionary fleet would even initiate a search on the basis of myths and rumour. No stone was to be left unturned in the search for the lost civilizations of mankind. Before they embarked on their journey though, one other important task was required. Although the warp storms had subsided, allowing travel once again across great distances, the navigator class from the past that would guide ships through the warp, this system though was far from perfect and the Emperor had a greater plan. On Earth, the Emperor ordered construction of the Great Astronomicon. 
tech priests from Mars were drafted in to aid in this project, and its purpose would be to enable the Emperor to guide, oversee, and command his vast fleet all from Terra. It created a system for him to focus, amplify, and broadcast psychic signals and energy. It would stand as an unchanging marker, a lighthouse for the navigators, a point of reference around which they could plan all their travels. This certainly was an important factor in the success of the Crusade as it enabled the navigators to travel through the warp in great leaps and faster than they ever had done before. In addition to this, the Emperor would also create the Astropaths. These were powerful psychers whose sole task would be in relaying communications from the fleet and later the established Imperium back to the ruling council on Terra. The vast distances involved meant that the Astropaths would become the only communication link between Terra and the distant colonies. However, as with the Eldar, the risk of possession to the Astropaths by warp demons consuming the psychers and thereby enabling them to travel into the material world was one that the Emperor was all too aware of, especially after his Primarchs had been scattered throughout the galaxy. To this end, the Astropaths would undergo an extreme and harsh process of toughening against the threat of warp entities. The Emperor himself would manipulate and reform their mind into a protective vessel, making them nearly immune to risks from the warp. This process, though, was agonizing and extremely dangerous. Many psychers were killed in the process or went completely insane. Even if they survived the process, a universal effect would see their optic nerves become damaged beyond repair. This meant all astropaths are blind. From the Imperial perspective though, this was a necessary consequence as they continued to be an integral part of Imperial infrastructure. The Crusades had begun, and alongside Space Marines were hundreds of thousands if not millions of Imperial troops, humans who were salvaged from the aftermath of Terra and structured into an effective, albeit expendable, fighting force. This Imperial Guard was strengthened and resupplied as they reconnected and conquered lost human colonies. A secondary benefit was that in drafting local military forces into the expeditionary force, it removed these planets' ability to rebel effectively against the newly created Imperial outposts on each planet. Also, in these early days, taxes and tribute to the Imperium were not strictly required, but Imperial commanders stationed on new colonies of the Imperium would often require supplies for the continuing crusade. Many systems and colonies would need help rebuilding or periods after generations of schooling by iterators to bring them in line and around to the Imperial truth and loyalty to the Imperium. Some worlds though who were self-sufficient had survived intact and would even welcome the arriving Imperial forces with open arms as long-awaited brothers, with glorious celebrations and immediate support, much to the satisfaction and pride of the expeditionary forces who were all too happy to welcome their brothers back to the Imperium. Such events were a blessing to behold though, as many worlds were either barren wastes long since destroyed, with only ruined remains to prove that anyone had ever existed there. Or they were found to be locked in brutally tyrannical dictatorships and required sometimes days, often weeks of orbital and ground assault to subdue and conquer these false dictators. Religious doctrine and faith were especially highlighted to be crushed on all worlds. The Emperor would never allow these practices to infringe or threaten the Imperium as he was partly responsible and had even seen the effects these caused on humanity millennia ago in the first age of mankind. The Emperor also made an important choice that upon arrival to New Worlds, any psychers discovered were told to expect transport back to Terra, courtesy of secretive black ships. Here they would be tested on their journey back to Earth to their limit. They would endure nightmarish examination, some dying from the trials or executed for being just too unstable. Others though ended up completely losing their minds in the process of these harsh examinations. The fate of these individuals was at the time unknown. It later transpired that if they were proven strong and capable enough in manipulating their psychic power, they would become stock for creating new astropaths by the Emperor. Any younger but highly powerful psychers were subsequently distributed to some of the Space Marine Legions who had begun a Librarius program, creating special Astartes who were capable of wielding immense psychic power. Others though disappeared from record entirely, leading to supposition of secret organisations who even today are not fully disclosed. The Crusade continued for centuries stretching out across the galaxy. 
Finally, the Primarchs were reunited with their legions and were duly given positions on the Crusade and Imperial War Council. The Primarch figures though were not suited to this level of administration, they were at their best out among their marines leading campaigns, so it fell to the administrators of man to run the day to day crusade infrastructure. One important figure arises again, that of Malkador the Sigilite. He would become a keystone in the execution of the crusade and one of the most loyal and valuable members of the imperial council. The power of the Imperium had now reached its peak, there seemed to be little, if anything, that could threaten, damage or destabilise the glory and power of the now reunited Imperium of Man. The Crusade had in fact been so successful that after a chain of impressive victories, the Emperor decided he could fully return to Terra to continue managing his plans there and working on new secret projects. His Primarchs were surely more than capable of finishing the now simple task of scouting and securing any fringe colonies and bringing the Crusade to a successful conclusion. After a specifically great victory on Ulanor, the Emperor selected the first Primarch and commander of the Lunar Wolves known as Horus Lupercal and bestowed upon him the title of War Master. This title established him as a leader of the Imperial military forces in lieu of the Emperor and all other Primarchs and Imperial forces would follow the War Master's commands as if they were the Emperor's. Not all the other Primarchs seemed to be entirely comfortable, not only with this decision, but also with the Emperor's choice to leave them and return to Terra. Considering their strength of character this seems somewhat surprising, but if anything it shows that their bond they shared with the Emperor was perhaps not rock solid and some of them felt bewildered he should choose to leave them on the fringes of the galaxy when overall victory seems so near and so secure. Horus, whilst being a supreme master of military matters, was also less well known for being exceptionally tactful and charismatic. He would take time to speak to each of his brother Primarchs in turn, understanding them as he did, he would employ his various skills of perception and charisma to appeal to their individual natures and reassure them that although the Emperor had granted him this glorious honour, it was the Brotherhood together who would achieve the ultimate victory. This helped quell some of the disquiet, but it was not only the Primarchs who felt bemused that the Emperor had abandoned them, and in time, this in combination with other unfortunate events would lead to the darkest of catastrophes. In fact, there have been many examples throughout human history where withholding information would lead to disaster, and this period for humanity would be no exception. The Emperor's decision to not make his space marines aware of the dark forces of chaos for their own benefit, in fact even to this day, the vast majority of the Imperial citizenship lives blissfully unaware of the darkness that lies in the Immaterium. The Emperor's precise reasons for this are not crystal clear, perhaps he felt that humans were too easily persuaded or tempted by the promises of quick easy power, but whatever the reason, the consequences for the Primarchs and Space Marines to not be able to see this danger as well as the Imperium would be disastrous. The Astartes legions had encountered vague clues and shrouded warnings on some lost human worlds they encountered, whispers in the wind, apparent possession of marines. Horus and his Lunar Wolves discovered direct evidence of some dark force when they encountered a lost but highly advanced human colony known as the Interrex in the later stages of the Expeditionary Crusade. As the fleet travelled to the Interrex homeworld they engaged in extended peaceful negotiations, again this was an example of the Space Marines and notably Horus not giving preference to immediate combat but in choosing a peaceful option if this was viable to them it was always preferable. Their mission of Imperial Truth was without question, it was the only resolution that would ever be acceptable to the fleet though. Now during this encounter, Garviel Loken, who was the Lunar Wolves 10th captain and a member of the Mournival, uh, the Mournival was a close and under Imperial rule illegal clique of brothers, but one which Horus had allowed to exist so as to help advise him on matters of importance. Loken was among the Warmasters party when they attended a reception with these Interrex during negotiations. He was drawn into a casual conversation with one of the Interrex guard who admitted that the Interrex had learned to tread carefully with any newcomers to their people because they feared the taint of chaos with a K on these newcomers. It becomes apparent that the Interrex colony had made dealings with the Xenos race, the Eldar, during the Age of Strife and the Interrex explain how it is their understanding from what they could discern from the Elder that chaos is a threat like no other. 
that it would not appear brutal or blunt at first, but subtly. They feared chaos deceptively approaching their space, posing as a friend, seeking to bleed its way into their confidences, and then destroy them mercilessly from the inside out. Loken was shaken at these unknown revelations, and the Warmaster Horus would later assure him that there is no fundamental evil in the galaxy, and that is the end of the matter. But the seeds of suspicion are planted. Loken cannot shake this feeling that something, somewhere, is wrong, but before he'd have any opportunity to follow up and explore these doubts, a break-in occurs in one of the Intrex's most sacred museums, and a highly advanced blade known as an anatheme is stolen. At this time, despite Horus's pleas for restraint, negotiations would now collapse and the Lunar Wolves and the advanced Interrex would fall into all-out conflict. The Space Marines of Horus are ultimately victorious over the Interrex, but it's a victory Horus takes no pleasure in, as it's born out of misunderstanding and was a tragic, unnecessary conflict. These events, though, would become just a singular fragment in a deteriorating pattern of troubles that would haunt and gesticulate within Horus, as well as his unease then irradiating out into his brother Primarchs, the Mournival, his and other legions. Unbeknownst to Horus, a sequence of events had been now initiated, and their cascade could not be prevented. So why are these events so important? Well, for one, it gives more insight into the fact that at the time, it seems barely any space marines at any level of rank had any knowledge of chaos. And if they did, it was only the vaguest of suspicions, the kind that could easily be brushed off by speaking to, say, some iterators. They had no idea about the true nature or capabilities of the malevolent force known as chaos. By comparison, the Emperor understood all too well the dark forces that had very recently annihilated the Eldar and consumed so many human colonies throughout the Age of Strife. It seems strange that he would choose not to gift his Astartes, and more importantly his Primarchs, with this information so that they could best protect against its darkness. But perhaps he feared that knowledge of the warp entities would do more harm than good, instead choosing ignorance as the best policy. However, a combination of time, doubt, rejection, jealousy, and greed brewing in corners of the Astartes' legions would prove this to be an unwise decision.